No, no, I have it already updated. So, um, and we can update it further. Yeah. All right, just to. So, uh, let me get find the microphone somewhere. Which is uh, which is a coordination action that is supported by FET, as you might all know. Um, Tony Prescott here in the room is one of the consortium members. So it's Stefano Passanelli and Giacomo who couldn't make it, and also Eric the Shooter in Okinawa and Ralph Ten J Cummings and Johns Hopkins, and we have these uh, non-European partners that don't receive money from the project because you know the regulations with the Commission. Um, because we were asked by the European Commission to, to look also at international trends, like trends in, in research, in, in the, the conversion science of biomimetics and neurotechnology uh, that fall outside of, of Europe. So this is what we have been doing. Um, so one of our missions is then is to, to get to an overview of where we're going with this field. And um, today's event is then part, part of that, and I will give you some more information on what we've been doing so far, okay? Um, the program, this is, let's say, the tentative program that we put together. So uh, these timings, uh, yeah, okay, I don't, they don't mean very much because I think we have basically four, um, oh wait, this is an error, okay, I will fix that later. Uh, let's just start until lunch. Lunch will be served here at uh, very nearby around the corner. And then we spent the afternoon in a bit more an open uh, discussion oriented uh, uh, format, but also we can just uh, shift the talks that were listed here before lunch to after lunch and we're fine. Okay. Uh, same thing tomorrow morning where we will have some uh, contributions of different people. Um, and again, after, after lunch, we will have discussion. Why did we go for this format? So the idea is that at the end of the line, so by the end of tomorrow, we have a bit of convergence um, about recommendations we could think about making towards the European Commission. Like where are we going with this field? Um, but that of course also implies what's this field really about? Uh, what are our challenges? What are the problems? Where, what do we want to achieve? Okay. And so what we are committed to, and would we also very much uh, include Tony and, and Anamura there, who also does a lot of work for us in CSN, especially towards educational activities, educational roadmaps, and organizing our events. Um, what's the kind of project, a large scale European level project we have in mind for this field? What, what do we want to push for? And I think if um, it would be my, my wish that we get to some, let's say, co a common understanding of what it would be. Um, and I will, I will motivate that uh, in, my, in my presentation to give you a bit more context on that. Um, so that's, that's the idea. If I think so from my perspective, we should leave it all very open that we, have, that we focus more on discussion than on, let's say, unilateral presentation. But it also means, so if I look at the different projects, and uh, I've, when I was putting this together, I had forgotten the acronyms of this project, but we'll fix that later. Um, it's not so much about hearing the project structure, like, oh, these are our work packages, and this is what we're doing. I mean, who cares, right? We, all, we know how, how, how this works. So we don't need to hear that. The issue is much more what are the scientific objectives, what are the technological objectives, and how do we see that extrapolate into, into our future activities, right? So think about it in these terms. We get approached by project officers from the European Commission who just ask, look, we need in input for our next call. So what do you tell these people, right? So these are the kinds of issues we have to create some clarity on. So that's what I have in mind. Um, so any, any amendments to this? To this plan or suggestions? No? Okay. Yeah, tomorrow we will have time to discuss what we want to do tomorrow. Right. And to okay. Yeah, and exactly. Mm -hmm. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, so Roberto Singulani and Stefano Fassadelli both have sort of personal problems that, they, that prevented them from joining us. Um, so they'll be then joining us tomorrow uh, via Skype. So, but that, that's all right. 
is handled. Okay. So this is the problem. Um, I will, I will use it. So, so, so in some sense, if you think about the technology we're building, right, and of course this is already biased by the kind of argumentation you would present to the European Commission, but if you look at the technology we're building today, we have massive problems of integration, right? So the, this, this airplane, which is an amazing piece of engineering, is, if you want, really at the limits of what, what humans can put together, right? So what, what, what we can produce. And you might remember the massive disasters that they hit when they realized that the front that was built in France and the back that was built in Germany had to be linked together, right? That all the wires were sort of shifted, so that they, <laughs> okay? <laughs> which is interesting. Um, anyway, but so, so what I'm saying is, in my outlook, and I will motivate this more okay, throughout, this is, this is illustrating on the one hand our achievement, but it also, it also illustrates our weakness and our, and our challenges, which is how are we going to build large-scale integrated systems that also have to interact with the real world, because don't forget, there's a cockpit here, this whole thing is operated by humans, so how can we build an autonomous technology that does things that, is, that are relevant to our society? How can we get to large-scale integration? What, what's the engineering of these kinds of large-scale integrated real-world systems? And the answer, the short answer from, from the perspective of the Convergence Science Network, it also certainly from the perspective of my own science, is by a biomimetically grounded approach. Um, like this one here. Like the bee is amazing. Uh, a cubic millimeter brain, about 200,000 neurons, uh, and it can do all these amazing things, right? It can navigate, it can fly, it can socially interact, it can communicate, it can memorize, it has, if you want, also proto-conscious proto states, according to some people, um, all in a cubic, cubic millimeter of brain, and we're not even close to engineering anything like this. So this is, if you want, the counterpoint to our, to our Airbus. Um, so, uh, okay, here you see the same thing uh, summarized, but what we want to declare from, from the perspective of Convergence Science Network, and I think also the different projects that, that are represented here make a similar point, is if we want to make progress in engineering this technology, it would give us mileage, it would give us leverage to look at, to look at biology. Um, so that's what we want to do, but then of course the problem is, how do you turn that into an engineering method? And how do you make it valid? What are the application areas we should worry about? And so on. This is not, of course, you have to wish, as expressed here, like, wouldn't it be cool? But that's not enough, right? Because this wish has been sold to the politicians now for the last 30, 40, 50 years. Depends how you, how you, how you count, what you look at. And that's not enough anymore, right? You cannot say like, oh, now we're going to be biologically inspired and then the world will be fantastic. Okay, we need to really spell out a clear trajectory to reach that target. This is the challenge. Um, okay, I will get to that later. Um, these are also just basically fundamental challenges that relate to the, to the way FET has been defining uh, the field of, let's say, their own activity in biology and technology. So the, the, where we see often the usual, the usual, um, if you want keywords like beyond von Neumann, uh, brain machine interfacing, nanotechnologies and so on. Uh, okay, we know that. That yes, these are interesting challenges, but I think the real problem is how do you bring this together in a coherent program? It's nice, oh, we should do a little bit of neurotechnology because it's cool, and we should do a little bit of material science because it's cool, and maybe we do a little bit of consciousness as well, that's really cool, and then we do some neuromorphic engineering in a sort of a fragmented fashion, and that's problematic, because if you fragment, you die, right? So uh, our real challenge, I think also for our discussion, is to then say, okay, how do you bring all these interests together in a synergistic way, right, that are really complementary, that these fields support each other and advance knowledge in these fields, and how do you also make it a, a coherent story with respect to impact? Right? I think we also have to think a lot about the impact of our science. I mean, I, I believe, yes, please. Um, I have a question. Um, oh, really? Yes. <laughs> okay.
the centre of Asia, or is it just trying to teach it paradigms and um, mechanisms and kind of neurally inspired mechanisms that advance the possibilities of computational mechanisms? So that they're two separate. Obviously, the first one is a very high target to aim for. Mm -hmm. The second one is probably more manageable. Do you, do you, which do you see of those being the key? Well, I, as I will argue and I will try to illustrate, but uh, in a succinct way, it's both. So the idea would be, we study biology to extract principles, right? These principles we test using artificial systems. But in building these artificial systems to test these principles, we are building a new technology based on the same principles. So it's really doing the basic science, identify the principles, validate these principles in our technology. So it should go hand in hand, that's the idea. Okay. okay. Which I think is key. If you start to decouple that, then the scientific effort is meaningless with respect to the technology, and the technology is not relevant for the science, so it's not going to work. Mm. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay, here, human brain. Um, this is then an uh, example of from what we want to extract principles. Yeah, we have to worry a little bit about what these principles are. But the key thing, and this is now, this is also an important point for the technology. Brains don't exist in a vat, in isolation, and they're also not organized at only one level of specification. Right? So brains are parts, are embedded in bodies. These in turn might make groups and societies, but brains comprise also many cells, many neurons and glia cells that in themselves are built with molecules that form ion channels and um, you know the cytoskeleton and lipid membranes and so on. Right? So an important point to say here is, and this is also makes it I think a more inter interesting story for a technological uh, activity. So unique about brains is this multi-level organization and our real challenge is how do we understand biological systems from that multi-scale perspective? This is our challenge. Okay? And what I'm saying is if we want to ever solve this, this technological challenge of real-world systems with massive integration, this is the, the kind of structuring of, of systems that we have to understand, on which today we actually have very little progress. This is very much unknown territory. Yes, there's speculations, there are initial ideas. We cannot say, oh yeah, we really covered a large chunk of this. Right? So for instance, you can say, uh, from, uh, if you look at the history of science, right, there was this idea already expressed in the early 20th century about the unity of science. Right? We explain chemistry from physics and biology from chemistry and psychology from blah, blah, blah. You build it up like that. Well, we're stuck here, still stuck somewhere here, right? Where you see that actually material science, which is sitting very close to physics, is largely still an experimental science. It's not that this is all solved analytically and now we know how we get superconduction. No, it's very experimental, and that's cool. It's not a criticism of that field, but it is indicating that the, a multi-level study of nature is key. And not to say, oh, let's just go to a microscopic level, the subneuronal level, or the neuronal level, and that's enough. And then we regenerate everything else from there, as is the promise of, for instance, the Human Brain Project, of what's also called bottom-up modeling, right? We simulate everything, but starting at the level of details. And, and this strongly argues, or at least suggests, that there'll be a very naive view still going back to this idea of a unity of science, where the microscopic defines, in a unilateral way, the macroscopic. But we, we can discuss that and, and get back to that. We don't have to solve that problem, right? It's not up to us today to, or tomorrow to solve these problems, but I think it's more to find agreement in this, this intrinsic multi-scale organization of the systems we try to build and study. Um, so how do, you, how do you explain that? Well, I call that convergent validation, and uh, the basic notion there is to say, well, look, you know, a model is by necessity never true, um, a model might be useful, might help you to think about things, um, but models help you to integrate these different levels of description. Right? Models in biology, in neuroscience, can help you to integrate across anatomy, physiology, and behavior. And if your model captures these levels of description, then there's 
a bit a higher likelihood that the principles your model express have some bearing on these biological questions. Okay? So what you then see here is that multi-scale is therefore not only a, a, a property of what we try to understand, it also should be an intrinsic property of our method. And if you then want to bring that to, to behavior, um, that also means that in the end you, you're quite rapidly dealing with robots. Right? So that means the robot as such and the control system of the robot is now also part of your scientific method of studying a multi-level biological phenomenon. But the cool thing is, in building this artifact, you are actually also building a new technology that might have different applications. So that means the basic science exercise and its method automatically links into the application exercise. Um, so we have, so, so this is a bit of background of where, where we want to, the, the kinds of systems we want to get a handle on both from a scientific and a, an engineering perspective. Um, and then with that, with the convergent science network, start to pose the question, okay, but what has been going on in this field, right? So where are we? How are people grouped? What are the subdomains? What are the topics people investigate? Um, so this is another way to look at this. This is a, a slide from Tony making this same point, right? That the technology, the models, and the biology have, are in a synergistic relation, as I illustrated earlier with this uh, convergence uh, validation concept. Would you like to add something around this one, Tony? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay. Um, so, but it also, that, uh, it does make an important point here that, that you know, that biologically based versus biologically inspired, right? Convergence validation, as we just defined, really capturing this multi-level structuring of biological systems, it's not a matter of inspiration. It's trying to be very systematic in a methodological, in a very methodical investigation of these systems, right? So in that sense, we really, in my opinion, we really try to stay away from what you might call inspired. I can be inspired by this guitar, but there are no methodological commitments with inspiration, right? And what we need are methods in science. We don't need inspir inspiration. Is great. You have it in your dreams with drugs, whatever, rock and roll, right? But that's not a method, it has no consequences. You can just walk away from it and say, well, I was inspired by that, but now I'm not interested anymore. Okay, that, that's for artists. If we want to do science and technology, we need commitments that are, can be validated. So that's why inspiration is not something that um, we want to advance in, the, in these terms. Um, so this is now the scientific problem we want to solve. I want to jump ahead a little bit, there's a lot of stuff happening here. These are the definitional things. Um, here, I just want to alert you to the fact that, of course, in other countries, similar efforts are underway. You are all familiar with these efforts in the United States. And therefore, there's, a, there's in our discussion also a strategic question, like how do we position ourselves relative to if efforts funded by organizations like DARPA, who, for instance, try to build now an artificial bee, uh, Joe Ayers is, is uh, coordinating that project and they're, they're actually making really good progress. They have a flying device at the scale of a bee. Um, <clears throat> it's an amazing piece of engineering, but you already know what the application areas will be, right? So we have to think this also through in terms of, of our own objectives. Um, and I think there in Europe, we have other, other possibilities than just relying on, on military initiatives. Uh, but they have a whole workout program in the MAST program that now runs ready for a few years of how they're going to get to um, insect-based systems really solving very specific problems that they have identified in, in bat battlefields, battlefield situations. So this is a Synapse project you might be familiar with. Um, Synapse project, uh, Krabena Bohan is a, is a good example of that. There the idea is, uh, even though it's run by a number of companies like HP and, and so on, the idea would really be to build neuromorphic uh, systems, so silicon-based neural-like systems. Cobain has built a pretty amazing model of cortex, retina, and thalamus in that way. Uh, but there's only one system like it in the world, cannot be replicated, it's just too complicated and, and brittle. But it's a fantastic effort. And also in Europe, we have a very strong uh, neuromorphic engineering uh, field. 
that we um, should be mindful of. Uh, but okay, the big gorilla in the room is, is yeah, what we have to sort of keep in mind here. So from a strategic perspective, also in our discussion, is okay, what else is going on in the field? What, what has been shaping the European research landscape in this, in this domain? So what's the big gorilla in the room? Well, it's the Human Brain Project, it's the American Brain Initiative, or the Obama Brain Initiative. Um, these, certainly if you talk about linking to neuroscience, which, which I think is key if you want to advance technology, right now a huge chunk of European uh, funding, certainly from FET, for neuroscience research goes to the Human Brain Project. We also have some people here in the room who might be, uh, who are involved with, with the Human Brain Project. Um, we don't need to criticize the Human Brain Project, even though we'll say some things about it later. So it's not for me the objective for the comic days to complain about it, say, okay, it's terrible, money is wasted, even though I think it's true, but it doesn't matter what I think about that. But it is a, it's also a reality, it's a fact, right? So we have to, we have to deal with it. How do we make initiatives now complementary to that? How do we position ourselves relative to these large-scale initiatives? Because uh, they're not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, the same for the American Brain Initiative. So here it's very much about then this bottom-up simulation approach that Henry Markram has been advocating for many years. Uh, so in the American, the American Brain Initiative is very much technology heavy. There's a huge contribution from, let's say, the nanotechnology fields. People like Church in uh, Harvard, strongly engaged, also people like Terry Shinosky. But the first five years of the American Brain Initiative is purely focusing on technology development. Okay? So this, there's, there will be no real attempt yet to have, let's say, a neuroscience effort to apply these technologies. Um, so these are then the, the key. But then uh, the other thing we have to think of, in both cases, we, we, we are facing a fundamental problem. Anyone knows what this is? You all failed. <laughs> what is it? Huh? No. <laughs> exactly. It's NSA's data domination room. This exists. This is built, paid for by the American taxpayer by the National Security Agency, here sits their commander to dominate the data. Okay? <laughs> it's really built, this exists, okay? And in a, in a top secret facility. And the idea here is basically that uh, these people will be exposed then to all the key data that matters for issues of security, and they will have all these insights about how to make the United States more safer. <laughs> exactly. Oh, this will all happen for sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. But the cool thing is, the guy, who, the commander of NSA, is indeed a Trekkie. So he, in, so he insisted to build it like the Enterprise, and they did it, which is crazy, right? It doesn't make any sense. Well, that's exactly what it looks like, right? There's no control whatsoever. But what I, what I, why I want to sh put this up is. Um, so and then, of course, you sent in uh, Team America, right, to save, save the planet. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie Team America, I definitely recommend it. It's fantastic. It has a great uh, song as well, a great theme song, maybe something for our party, yeah. uh, for our song festival. But so, but the, why, this is a joke that, that has been realized. And for me, it illustrates a little bit all these problems around big data. And, and both the Human Brain Project and the American Brain Initiative are for touching upon big data issues, like more data, how do we store it, how do we accumulate it. And this might be one extreme where, where, where we might not want to end up. So this is something to, to keep in mind. Um, or as for Albert Einstein, he has a nice quote on that, right? So to make things bigger and complex is easy, but it takes a bit more effort to go in the opposite way, right, to abstract and actually see principles. This is our challenge. And I, I think we should get at least some hope from this, uh, from this message. So methodology, okay, I already commented on that. Um, so I wanna jump forward now a little bit. I don't, 
uh, want to talk too much about methodology, um, except then maybe, yeah, maybe. So this, <coughs> what's really important if we talk about studying living systems in this convergent validation approach, where you say the artifact is the theory in some sense, the machine is the theory if you want. It's not that we just invent it now, right? This idea of modeling biological systems has been going on for a long time, and we have to be aware that when Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA, um, these were mechanical models, right? They really had these plates cut out in the workshop, and they just mounted them together in different forms, so they could explain the X-ray diffraction data from Rosen and Franklin. So it was not that there was some mathematical description of the DNA uh, structure that, that they would then exploit. No, it was a, a physical model that they built. Okay? And I think this is very much illustrative. It's very paradigmatic for where you see things go in our field, where we build systems as models of the biology. But the big difference is, of course, we're building systems like robots. So now they can do something in the world. Right? We can actually utilize them. Um, so I illustrate that, so th th this relates, uh, so if we talk about convincing the commission of anything, the key issue is impact. And this is annoying on the one end because we all know you write these proposals and you have this whole section on impact which is getting more and more important, which means what does it mean to the taxpayer, right? What does it mean to the stakeholders of these programs? Um, but actually, it's maybe not such a bad challenge. Maybe there's nothing wrong with being relevant to society. I mean, because don't forget, we are still in a scientific model that sort of doesn't ask or give society a lot of influence on, on the topics being researched. Right? Science is still very much open to the scientists. This is good, gives us freedom, but it might not run like that forever. If resources are scarce, there will be more demands on what scientists do. So uh, the problem then is that we, we often have this ambition to be here in the pure basic science quadrant of Bohr, as Stokes described it in Pasteur's quadrant. But society or the European Commission might say, well, but I want you to be as applied as Edison. I want you to give us stuff that makes money for European industry and that gives us jobs and that heals people and so on. And then people have said, oh, but no, that's not my, my self-image dictates that I am a basic scientist. Then for Stokes, Louis Pasteur was like an exception doing both. But these are exceptional people. And I think this, this model, I think, is incorrect. And we, uh, certainly for our domain, we don't have to pursue this model. And I'm proposing something called Vico's loop, because Vico said that the fact and the truth is reversible, and that means you remember, I told you earlier, in our basic science effort, yeah, I have some self-serving uh, labels here, it doesn't matter. In our basic science effort, we build models that satisfy this notion of convergent validation, bringing the levels of description together in, let's say, a robot. This robot gives me behavior, I can test it. But building the robot gives me immediate applications, like Edison. I can be in these two quadrants at the same time. And the beauty of that is that actually in building my application, you can find validation of your theory. For instance, we are advancing a field that we call deductive medicine. So from our theories, we apply interventions in the clinic that we apply to stroke patients. If these interventions fail, they directly inform theory. So I'm saying we have an opportunity to directly link impact application to basic science. And I think that should also be our bias. We have many options to choose from, and I believe we would, we would be well served, both scientifically and as a society, we're all taxpaying members of a society, if we find this cross-link from the beginning, okay? Yes, we can decide to withdraw on our ivory tower and our workshops and not talk to each other, but it is not an intrinsic property of science. It's a choice we can make, and it's not necessary, and I think our science would be better if we phrase it also in terms of impact in this deductive fashion, where we see application as testing our hypothesis. And I will say something more about it a little bit with respect to robot companions and later. So um, this is from Tony's slides on our road mapping exercise we've done so far. Um, 
Tony has been leading that uh, with respect to, to the past together with uh, Nathan Lepora. We have developed some roadmaps that we published in a journal um, by inspiration by Memetics. You feel you can already see now oh, I was very happy with that. Um, so basically here you have a, a word cloud of what we've done and what Nathan and, and all of us have, have achieved with that is to get a bit of an overview. Where are we? What's this field of biomimetics? Yeah. Um, Tony, you want to say something about that or shall I just continue? Uh, yeah, I mean, so we analyze, I think, uh, um, the ice, ice and police database. Uh, and I think it's also a Is it on? Um, and we've got all the papers that used um, biomimetics or uh, words that were synonymous with biomimetics. Um, in those two places, and then I think it was the titles uh, that we used to generate. Uh, yeah, it says there that the, this word cloud, and so uh, certainly from that sample, uh, robotics and control come up as as some of the key things that people are doing in biomimetics. So I think we're we're looking at uh, not the full field of biomimetics. There's an awful lot of work on biomimetic materials, but certainly when you look at uh, interest in developing intelligent systems, then uh, we had good coverage of that. So the paper in Biomimetics and Bioinspiration is really looking back at um, what's been going on in uh, biomimetics research and how that's accelerated uh, over the last couple of years. And we've done some road mapping work, which isn't published yet, uh, looking forward. At, and I think this activity is part of that forward looking. So it, can you go back to the slide before about the methodology? It might be worth saying. Yep. Yeah, so we, uh, defining the domain, that's what we were doing there, describing the current state of the art, that's also what we were doing. Uh, we've, we've done some work identifying the significant actors and organizations, uh, and now we're, we're at this stage describing the landscape of future possible developments, including their impacts, future research, uh, commercial and societal impacts. Uh, and then I think as a result of of, of that activity, which is ongoing, we want to establish consensus about priorities, uh, then the benchmarks, and then report back to the commission and other uh, bodies that we want mm -hmm. to influence. Right. And then maybe it's useful to, to mention the different subdomains that we identified, Tony. Sure, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, what we saw is that if you, if you look at, at this domain of, of uh, biometrics, there are various groupings of, of topics. Of course, this is a very high level description of that, but there are also activities that we might be pursuing in our different projects that are not really represented in this. And then the question arises, well, is this now actually describing a coherent community uh, or not? And, and how, how, what's the impact of this community? Well, if you look just at the, how the number of publications in books, conferences, and journals is growing over the last years, it, it looks like exponential. Of course, you might have to also compare that to growth in other fields, but it means there's a lot of activity in this field. And if you now plot this out in, in a sort of, a, you make this a graph, and we, we look at, let's say, the distances among all these different uh, publications we found in that graph, you see that actually the cluster, it's not really split up in clusters that are disconnected, disjoint. Right, so it looks like the kind of description we found for the field is sort of a coherent grouping with certain if you issue on biases, which is a good thing. So there's, in that sense, on bio, bio, bibliometric grounds, you could say, well, there, there's a strong indication that we have here a coherent field that's active, that's growing. And the funny thing is, of course, we have no coherent educational program supporting this field. Neither do we have a, a coherent funding program that supports this field. And I think this is now our challenge. Uh, also today, in terms of road mapping towards the future, it's to how do we now extrapolate from this? Right? How do we make this field consolidate and, and grow? Um, so these are some of the main topics that, that popped up. Soft robotics, growing field in robotics, insect-based robotics, social robotics, tactile manipulation and sensing, brain-based robotics, uh, sensing systems, different kind of sensing systems, um, navigation, underwater vehicles, and micro-air vehicles. Um, so that means in the grouping we found, f uh, emphasizing very much the biomimetics angle, uh, a number of issues like, let's say, uh, brain-machine interfaces, um, uh, new materials, 
are not really popping out strong or neuromorphic engineering. Right? So this is then something to discuss. How do we, how do we find links between these uh, communities? So th this is not based on, on the preferences that Tony and I and others might have making the roadmap. This is really reflecting the bibliometric, bibliometrics that we analyze. Okay? This is not, in that sense, not a biased statement uh, or not overly biased in terms of our own interests. Um, so we communicated that uh, through this publication and that's also on purpose and also something, a message to us here. We chose for writing the roadmap as a publication on the one hand to get it if you want validated so it's peer reviewed. We cannot then just write anything but it also is a way to disseminate a roadmap. I know, for instance, NeuroIT, which was a coordination action that started maybe 10 years ago, somewhere even ages ago, ran by um, Alois Knoll, um, also built a roadmap. And that roadmap was sort of just like a, a piece of paper circulating as a PDF over, over internet. And it actually became very influential in terms of the European Commission picking lots of stuff from it for different calls with more or less success. But for us as outsider, actually you never really knew, what, okay, but what's really the validated version of this report? How did it change? How did it not change? And I think it's important therefore that we really, also for transparency, try to produce documents we can publish using standard dissemination channels and validation channels. Um, so we're also working on the handbook. It's another way to disseminate our roadmap. Tony and I are gonna finish it up during this year. If people are interested to contribute, please talk to us, uh, Tony. Um, we, we can certainly get, there are plenty of contributions we still want to get, Tony, do you have yeah, uh, There are some specific contributions, but we're also interested in uh, ideas that we haven't necessarily thought of. Um, and uh, we're looking for short papers, sort of uh, anything from two and a half thousand up to 5,000 words. Um, really state of the art, talking about the state of the art, but we have a particular format where you also can say, what are the interesting questions to, uh, to explore in the future? Right. So, um, yeah, we've got uh, around 40 chapters already and we're looking to, to have about 50 to 60 in the mm -hmm. final book. Right. So that's another medium that we then have defined now to, to disseminate roadmap uh, information. So if you want to contribute, please. Or if you know people you think want to contribute, then get them in touch with us. Um, Okay, so the, I made an important point about impact. Uh, so I think if we think about our roadmap, yes, there's always the point like, oh, but I, as an individual researcher, I'm really interested in a neuromuscular junction. And that's why everybody should study the neuromuscular junction and Europe should invest billions of euros in studying the neuromuscular junction. That's one view that you often see in these discussions. That's fine. We respect everyone's personal research interests, but it's not a helpful view, right? Because if you want to convince the European Commission how they should support us and how we should have, if we have to convince the European taxpayers, we have to make statements that go beyond personal preference, right? It's really about having a vision. Like where are we going to go? How are we going to build a better future if you want? And indeed, I mean, I have this kind of idealism about things. I think it is all about building a better future. So. Impact, I think, is therefore not just a little box we have to tick in our proposals. I think it really matters in our, in our science. So it will matter more in the future. Okay, so, so I think we can have a discussion where we, ha let's say, make it like a, like a competition among personal interests, and that's fine, but it won't, in the, in the end, help us. We need to talk about visions. What's the vision? Where do we want to go? And what's the big picture? Okay. Um, so, um, okay, not robots, there is the, the whole singularity discussion that we can have, but we're not going to have that now. But I want to flag this as an other, if you want, fringe area that we should be mindful of. That in, if we want to advance this kind of technology, let's say we want to build these advanced robot systems or whatever, these are the questions we'll bump into. And you know, across the ocean, there's this science religion movement of the singularity that tells us that this is a very scary de development and that we actually have to protect ourselves against. Oh, Oxford, there are some people, some representatives of the movement as well. It's at our fringes. So we, we cannot ignore these concerns and neither 
Um, so, but actually that's all Skynet, you know. Um, I just want to jump. Tony, this is not, I took these slides from you. So that means ethics in, in our activities are relevant. Again, I want to, if, so I'm making an important point, right? The science links to the impact. I know this is sometimes difficult to think about because you want to think of just what you do in the lab. But if you cross that bridge and say, yes, science has to link to impact, then the consequence of that is that you must be mindful of ethics. Don't you want to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, so the, what you see there is, is a letter written by the members of the Manhattan Project uh, at the point where they began to realize the potential, the destructive power of atomic energy. And uh, they wanted to declare uh, that they felt a responsibility for that and that, that they thought that as a society we should uh, really think about um, what we were doing there. And uh, it was a bit after the fact. Um, I, I think in our field there also are potentially huge impacts and not all of them are positive. Um, and people are uh, brainstorming these potential impacts. Uh, you all have come across the idea of the singularity, and there are now centers across the world looking at the potential of, for a AI singularity and whether that will be good or bad for us. And so um, engaging with these ethical questions uh, I don't think is really an, op uh, an option. I think we have to engage. The, r the risk is if we don't engage, then other people will look at this uh, in a, a less well-informed way or without uh, understanding really the science and technology that has to go into any sensible discussion of the potential impacts. And or if you look at the European funding programs, you see there's a lot of science and society projects funding uh, looking exactly at this. And the, the European Commission are experimenting really with a new model of how they decide what to prioritize in science. And that is to use the science and society uh, forward-looking projects to try and brainstorm w what would be good and what would be bad research to do in the future. So we have to uh, uh, be part of that uh, if we're going to ensure that uh, our research continues to be funded and that our research uh, is done with the, these kinds of larger long-term questions in mind. Okay. So this, that means from our perspective, um, in the discussion of our future, we are advocating as CSN, also given our internal discussion, a, a more integrated approach than, than you might be used to. Okay, so that we really think about the impact, not only like, oh, and now we can build an autonomous uh, oil drilling platform, but there's also now this, this additional consequence of impact. These are ethical considerations. And to sort of own, if you want, or to, to really be an active part of that discussion as opposed to delegating that to the non-informed ethical specialist, as Tony just said. Um, so we don't have to go into the details of that. Um, so let's, let's jump ahead. It was just to, al to alert you to, um, to that. So now, um, what are we having in mind? So now to focus a little bit more on what, 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 what I think we, we should be doing in the coming two days. We have to inform the European Commission where we're going with our science. Now, this is a good moment to do that because you know the Commission is changing. There's a lot of uncertainty uh, within FAT. They don't even know whether it will exist a year from now and so on. So that also means if we want to inform and we want to bias, this is not a bad moment to start to become vocal on that. Yeah? But we have to be clear about what we want if we just go to them and say, oh, we believe we're really very smart people and we deserve all your money, it's not going to work. Okay? So um, we have to be clear about what we want and why this needs to be done. Why is this relevant? Okay? So now we have already, um, as, as a start, uh, as in any Business, right? If you set up a business, basically you need you need a product, a market, and a team. That's all the key thing, right? So for a successful project, the same thing holds, right? So we need to define our challenge. What is the this societal problem we're solving? What's our solution, and what's the team that's going to do it? 
So it's just to kick off the discussion, I have some suggestions what this could be. So the challenge would be this one here, a dignified, sustainable society. It's very, it is essentially the challenge that I defined for robot companions. Um, so this is, I think, where we have a major opportunity because society will need technology to, to become sustainable. Um, we can discuss this if you want in more detail, but I think it's, it's fairly apparent. You can think about disaster management, you can think about elderly care, you can think about how we run our urban environments. Right? We need technology to, to sustain and improve quality of life, but it also includes education, um, health, agriculture, transportation, and so on. Um, the answer, this is again a drawing that we produced, Anna with uh, uh, Alvaro uh, Martinez. Um, what this could be? Well, this could be future kind of artifacts. Now, I, I would define in this case this artifact very broadly. It doesn't need to be an anthropomorphic robot. I think that would be very naive. It's not about robotics. It can be a whole building. It can be your car. Your, it can be my pointer, whatever. Right? We need to have integrated advanced sensory motor artifacts. I would call them conscious but this might trigger all sorts of discussions that are, that are unnecessary, that maybe not be. Then the problem is the one already sketched out to you. This doesn't work. Uh, the solution is our B, we discussed that. Um, but it also means biology offers us a whole ecology of solutions, right? So given that there's a whole ecology of illusions, we can, of, of solutions, we can think also about an ecology of artifacts that on the one at the hand study these solutions but also transform them into applications that we can insert in society. Then what's this technology? How do we go from the brain to the robot uh, with magic? Uh, this is the structure I built for robot companion. I mean, I wrote all the science, the whole scientific program was put together by me um, with contributions from specific people on, on details. So this was my design, but I would think to reflect this multi-scale nature of the phenomena that we want to build, we must express that in our uh, research program. And I really think we have to go from materials to bodies to brains to minds and societies. These are the levels of description that we have to bring together. And we then practically have to define a research program that tells us exactly how this is going to happen. Um, so the machine is our theory to do that. I already explained Vico's loop, how this then also automatically links together basic science with application, so we don't have to have a disjoint uh, basic science and impact program, it's not necessary. And for that, what we're working on now is what we call the Living Machines Manifesto, which we also discussed in the last Living Machines conference, which will reflect these basic steps that I just sketched to you. The problem of integration, the problem that our society faces, we need technology to overcome these problems and how this biomimetic conversion validation approach can help us achieving that, by also closing this innovation loop with basic science. Um, so this is in short, in our view, that means when I speak for the Conversion Science Network or into how we see we want to move forward, where we want to go, which means it's an ambitious program, it's large scale and essentially what I would like us to do is that in about four, three to four years from now, we have a very concrete proposal to the European Commission with a large community behind it of hundreds of PIs and research centers and so on to say, and this is where we're gonna go. And it's not covered either in the public-private partnership in robotics, neither is it covered in the Human Brain Project. Because I think both these projects are not gonna deliver uh, Tony and I have been very active in the, in the Robot Companion flagship. Tony has been pushing a lot of the societal aspects and the, the ethical aspects of it. I've been pushing very much the, the science program. And the one thing we didn't do was the politics. And that's what in the end was screwed us. Um, but what I learned from the Robot Companion flagship is that I believed when we started out and linking up with robotics and engineering, that that would lead to a lot of synergy between domains. And I think that that was a massive failure. There was essentially mainly conflict between robotics, engineering, and neuroscience, and what came beyond, let alone psychology and so on. And we never overcame that. So 
the traditions of, of robotics and engineering in, did not allow us to find really a coherent integration with the culture of, let's say, neuroscience. It was a culture clash. Okay? And uh, th there was a, a famous book written in the, in the 50s by Snow called The Two Cultures, about how science and the humanities would never be able to talk to each other. Okay? But what we discovered was the two cultures of, if you want, engineering and science. The criteria are very different. And I would really be, in this case, um, this is not a statement against robotics activities, but if we want to link science and, and, and engineering together, we have to move carefully. We cannot just say, oh, let's bring a bunch of engineers together with a bunch of neuroscientists and they will just understand each other. It's a bit the problem that, that the modern Western world is now facing with all these immigrants. Like in Holland, they have lots of conflicts now with different minority groups in the country that came from different cultures. And why is that? Because they brought these people to countries like Holland in the 50s and 60s, which is, but, but of course they will see that our way of life is the best. It's obvious, we don't need to explain it. But it isn't obvious, these things aren't obvious. So that this leads to trouble. And in a big multidisciplinary activity like this, it's also really about gr building a culture of, of multidisciplinarity and exchange. And if you just lump people together and say, and, but of course they will see that biomedics is the way, that's not going to work. Okay? So in that sense, what I certainly learned from Robot Companions is that we have to grow and build such a community uh, more carefully and more, more, with more deliberation. It's also for that purpose that Convergence Science Network for the last five, six years is supporting schools like this one here and our conference and Kapokasha and so on and also tell her right now, but in an attempt to try to slowly build a culture in which we can deploy and develop large-scale uh, initiatives. Now, there are many other lessons from the flagship exercise that was sort of huge investment of time over a period of, what, four years, Tony? Somewhere? Yeah, four years, uh, but not all wasted. So basically, our approach is to say, look, in Robot Companions, we were third, as you know. We were killed on the politics. I can tell you the story if you want. But there's a lot of good science in it. There were a lot of good ideas in there that are up for grabs in some way, that are still valid. And what, what we're proposing is to also capitalize on that, use these in, a, in a, this larger vision that I sketched out to you, and build a community around that. All right? So that's why we're here to, what we're here to, to discuss. Uh, this is not a religion. I mean, for instance, the Human Brain Project was also really advanced as a very person-centered religion about science, right? So we don't want to do that. We really want to, f our value should really be just scientific excellence and the sharing of a vision on our science. If you don't share scientific, if it's all opportunism, for instance, there was recently this letter written in protest against the Human Brain Project, right? That's nice, but it's pure opportunism. Some members were just kicked out of the Human Brain Project they were, of course, unhappy with that. And then suddenly a protest letter was written, like the whole project is bad. If these guys would still be a member of the Human Brain Project, this letter would never have been written. Okay? So these things don't help. All right? If we really want to make progress, we should insist on excellence, and we should understand our vision. Where do we go? This is, this, so in that sense, we're not going to compromise anymore with, with politics and, and, and so on. If co the commission doesn't like a scientific vision that as a, collection, as a collective, we think is our future, then that's also the Commission's problem. Right? But I think we shouldn't compromise too quickly. And this is what was one of our drawbacks of our Robert Companions uh, initiative. So that's a little bit of background and a little bit of also a proposal to, to people who are not part of Convergence Science Network, like how we have been discussing this so far, how we see it. It's just a, a kickoff. So if you disagree, that's great. Let's discuss it. But of course, we want to hear the arguments. and. Um, Let's also hear from the other people in the audience, um, the other projects that, that are represented here, uh, to see what kind of common ground we can find around these themes. Okay? So the idea would be, let's now hear from you for the coming part. Then the second part of today, tomorrow, is then the discussion, where we can be a bit more focused in our brainstorming, identifying themes, and so on. Yeah? Uh, Jörg. So can I push you a little harder on, on your phone? Please push me, Jörg.
There was a second. Do we have a microphone, Tony? Okay. Um, I have two microphones, fantastic. So, so let me push you a little harder on yeah. your overall vision. Um, as you know, I, I like the idea very much, and I, I come from the same background, same inspiration. But all you're offering right now is what, what I heard you're offering is, let's look at biology, and then we do great things. Everything will be amazing if we copy mm -hmm. biology, if we take the principles mm -hmm. into technology. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't we, don't we have to be much more concrete on, on what vision we have, where are we looking, at what level we want to implement, and so on. Absolutely. Because that, that's really bionic, what you're outlining, and that, that has been around for the last 30 or 40 years, as you said, and they've had successes, they had failures, so mm -hmm. it sounds like no, an right. old story. Mm -hmm. So, so should, don't we have to go much more concrete? Absolutely. Yeah. I just didn't want to do that yet, because I wanted to leave things a little bit open for the discussion. If I now give you a lot of detail, like, and we have to do this and that, and we have to solder this together, and we have to build a, a bee, and, and we have to build a dog, or whatever. It sort of quenches a bit discussion. So I just wanted to give a bit of big outline. Yes, I have my personal preferences, and we will discuss them, right? For instance, I think we must emphasize high-level issues like consciousness. I think they're key to make progress. But this is also a personal preference. It's a hypothesis. It doesn't help when I start to inject it at this stage, because of then suddenly we're discussing consciousness, and this would be completely irrelevant, I think, in getting a first pass on this overall vision. So you're absolutely right. We must make things way more concrete to be convincing. But that's what I would like to do collectively. This is my point. Yeah? Yeah. So I think uh, one thing that maybe Paul didn't emphasize, but he might have put in, is, is an emphasis on multiple scales of not just... Uh, uh, these these systems and how we might uh, think of them, but how we might try and, and build models of them. So uh, w one of the things that y is, is notable about the Human Brain Project is it's focusing on one level of description and analysis uh, where they think that the progress will be made at the circuit level. And uh, th they have a strong claim that cognition will ultimately be explained uh, by models at that level. And I think a, a counter uh, a position to that is to say that different levels of description actually uh, stand on their own as valid ways of trying to understand biological systems and complex systems like robots. So to uh, embrace this uh, multi-level of approach of explanation, uh, I think is also something right. that, that would help us stand out. Well, that's also why I used that slide, right? To, yeah. to emphasize that point very much. This is, I think, this should be one of our mantras, right? Multi-level. Yeah. I mean, this, impl this, this tells us about the physical scales, but I think sort of in terms well, of... Cities, groups, yes, yeah, societies. Yeah. Yeah. But you're right, I agree with you. Yeah? Jörg, can you pass the microphone? Um, you touched on strategy and politics a little bit there. Um, and I share your idealism in terms of a project like this can help society in some way. And I think you used the word uh, sustainable and what was the other word? Dignified. Dignified mm -hmm. and sustainable. That's uh, idealistic and it's a good aim for, but you have to be aware that you will come up against vested interests who will probably not necessarily share your idealism there. Mm -hmm. And that might have an impact on how successful your uh, approach is. Um, there are people who may have an opposite opinion that may not want either a dignified or a sustainable society. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> sure. So it's yeah. worth bearing that in mind. I, I, I don't know what the story of the politics with you were discussing with your previous project, but I mean, I, um, that is obviously, in a on a strategic level, that is going to have an mm -hmm. impact on things. You're absolutely right. Uh, we cannot be naive there. And you must, of course, engage with, let's say, politics, policymakers, and so on. But concretely, right now, we have requests from people in the commission who say, look, we want your roadmap because we are having the internal discussion now. You have to tell us what you want. So that's one step, okay? This is the first step. And then in parallel, we just have to identify also at national levels, representation for, for such initiative. And that also then implies that at these national levels, you must engage also with other stakeholders. We have to identify those stakeholders. And politics is one, industry is another one. Okay. Hmm. So yes, you have to embark on that. But this only becomes an issue when there's a clear vision right, on, on where you want to go collectively. But you're absolutely right. Sure, we cannot be, it cannot be the case that you tell people, look, this will be fantastic, and then some will roll over and just throw money at you. No, that, 
It, I mean, it may be the right vision, but there will be people out there in the, in the, in the wider world who may not want that vision to come about. <laughs> well, but then the point is basically we have to argue with, with examples. Do we have examples where we show this kind of... We do. Mm. We have to find more. Right? And so in that sense, it, that it's not just a matter of comparing beliefs or opinions, but you really can show the beginnings of that kind of impact. So, so, but yes, we you have to be astute about this and also at times cynical. We cannot believe that just idealism will win the day. I agree with you. That would be very naive. You're right. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, with Robot Companions, we, we were very worried about the political angle. And we thought, oh, we must get people on board who are really dyed in the wool of politics of Europe. And this will be a great help. But it wasn't. Okay, It just led to a massive amount of problems in the end failure. Okay, so then I think we might do better, let's say, steering a bit more idealistic course that is clear about its values okay, and, and objectives, because at least you can identify where the conflicts arise. Okay. Other remarks or questions? Okay, cool. Then we can um, go back to our program. So Stefano, do you want to say something on these topics from the perspective of Brain Leap? That would be cool. Anna, uh, what time is, do we have lunch? Two o'clock. No, 40 minutes then. Okay. That's cool. So you need this one, and I have to remove this one. <laughs> yeah, that might be an idea. Be careful. Yeah, yeah, I already dropped it several times. I, I think that I need your microphone too. Oh, yes, you're right. Okay. Hi, I'm Stefano Ferraino from uh, Rome, Sapienza. Uh, I'm not the coordinator of Brain Leap, Michele Giuliano from Antwerp. It's actually the coordinator, but uh, I asked another meeting on the, on the day. So um, um, I'm not sure that I'm the right person in the right place. <laughs> anyway, so uh, my, our... It's a point in time to tell us that stuff. <laughs> Uh, our, our project was actually financed by FET, uh, but it's not really related to biomimetics. You will see the few details that uh, I'll be providing the, in the slides prepared. Uh, it's about neurotechnology. And uh, actually, I'm a neurophysiologist, uh, so I'm very attracted from whatever from the technology could solve problems in the uh, basic science and open to interface with other fields because I'm collaborating with physics the, uh, and the engineer for developing some of these uh, probes that um, um, uh, are actually the, the goal of Brain Leap. So you see the title of Brain Leap is the quantum leap that uh, was proposed from a spike-centered uh, brain universe to uh, something that is more, that is understanding the synaptic activity with more detail. Uh, I, one of the uh, arguments that I would like to point out, out as a, um, an important difference to whatever is a brain-related activity, uh, that is my hope for uh, whatever brain-related activity in the future, that is that uh, on the opposite of what uh, on Brian Lip was stated since the beginning, I think that everyone in the audience agree that uh, we don't know uh, a lot of the, of the brain uh, is working. So it prob probably we still need a lot on basic science activity, and in particular, from my point of view, on, the, on using animal models. And within animal, animal models, uh, those that provide access to high-level uh, aspects of, of behavioral control, when you talk about cognition or 
uh, argument like this one. So the uh, the uh, the the brain, uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, based on a very complicated uh, structure that uh, uh, and mo mo most of, of the details uh, of the structure in this case is only the cortex uh, where. Uh, some of the news are located, some of the millions of news that uh, Paul uh, indicated before are located, and uh, we know that there are different kinds of news, that there are different ways to, to de describe this uh, complicated structure. And uh, during the years of neurophysiology, we had the opportunity to study this structure using uh, electrodes, different kind of electrodes. But the uh, main uh, uh, measure that uh, uh, we have been able to, uh, to study, in particular when the uh, neural activity was studied in an um, intact animal, so in a behaving animal, is the spike activity, the firing rate of neurons. Uh, this slide, I think, is very interesting, at least, at least to me. It showed that uh, the, uh, if we consider the number of neurons spiking in the brain, uh, the number of neurons that are, uh, are active is very limited. And, it's, uh, and uh, for all those neurons that are more active, these neurons are ma mainly located in a few of the layers of the cortex. So the main message is that uh, we have the tools to look at the neural activity. That is the main code, uh, one, of the, one of the codes, actually, of the brain. But this code is not able to uh, to uh, inform us of uh, everything that is going there. So it's uh, the tip of the iceberg of whatever is uh, in the complicated structure that we name uh, brain. And uh, uh, on, the, on the other side, we have an uh, opportunity in, the, in the some uh, animal models, uh, but with very uh, strong limitation, to study uh, other aspects of the neural code. This is the a change in the membrane activity. You know, that uh, when a signal arrives to whatever neuron, this is integrated at the level of, uh, of uh, synapses. This stays often under threshold, and only when the threshold is, uh, is, uh, is reached, uh, the, there is a spike. Not all of the neurons are able to emit spikes. This was the message of a few slides uh, before. But we know that there is a lot of activity at, that, at the level of uh, me membrane potential. Uh, in uh, rodents, for example, it's possible to patch clamp uh, neurons. Patch clamp means uh, having a physical touching uh, uh, of your uh, uh, pipet, that is a sort of electrode to the membrane, and then measuring the slow uh, oscillation of, of current at the level of the membrane of a single neurons. Because of the mechanical limitation, this could be done only in uh, small animals and uh, with the very limited behavior. So I cannot have the rodent uh, moving around because the, the, the patch will be impossible. And I cannot ask the, the rodent to move the, their arm. They, only are, they are fixed usually to have a surgery uh, uh, stereotactical. And then they actually explore the environment with just moving the wish, whisker. So uh, my, my point that, that was actually the interest to, from the neurophysiology point of view to the to the Brain Leap uh, initiative was that uh, we know that the, there is a book, this is our brain, this is very complicated with a code, this is a, the language how it's written, but we have not the right tool to, to read. At the moment we are able to read the book on, on, the, on the way or it's in the left part of the, of the, of the, of the figure, while uh, uh, providing the right lenses will, could help us uh, to, to decode the, the signal uh, better. And now I'll show you very rapidly what I mean with the uh, uh, multiple level of approach to the code and what is the advantage of this uh, multi-scale, if you want, uh, study of uh, neural activity. Uh, this is from our, uh, my lab. It was produced in 2010. It's a recording of a neural activity obtained from a single electrode. Uh, in the uh, one of the motor region of the frontal lobe. For the animal, the task was very simple. There are light moving in, in, a, in a touch screen and the, the, arm, the arm moves from the center to the periphery of the, this touch screen. So following lights in order to receive reward. So when you see go, means that the animal was required to move 
and the movement uh, was starting at this time, and then the movement and uh, now, and there is a reward to provide it. Uh, as a signal, this is the, uh, the code that uh, most of the uh, neuroscience, uh, system neuroscience behavior based uh, uh, papers reports, that is the neural code on frequency. This is, uh, are the spikes emitted by the neurons that is very close to the, to the electrode. You see that there is an, uh, it's a, just a, 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 a graphical representation of the frequency. So it, when, when you see a lot of sign means that the neurons is discharging more. When you see less uh, dots means that the, 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 the neurons is discharging less. If, you're, if you look at this activity uh, that is replicated for many trials uh, around the behavioral uh, uh, events, you see that this neurons is very active before the go signal. Then uh, there is a, a bump when the signal is provided. It's a sign of arriving in, the, in this portion of the brain of the visual related activity. And then there is a decay of activity until there is a further bump at the time of movement generation. So this is a, a good way to show that there is a, a movement related activity in the, in the brain that could be decoded by a, a single electrode very close to the neuron that's part of the cortex, that is our motor cortex in this, in this case. And the upper part of the, of the figure show a very different uh, uh, figure, actually, because it's the, just uh, the spectral decomposition of the, of the signal derived from the same electrode. So usually the spike is obtained because you filter high passing uh, the signal on the frequency that is on the, on the scale, on the temporal scale of the spike. Since the spike is very rapid, it's one millisecond, you look at the kilohertz range of your signal. But if you open your filter, you look at all the signal, so it's the raw signal, then your spectral decomposition offer you t the possibility to, to obtain more signal from the same source. And you see that in this time there are low frequency and uh, gamma frequencies, or very high gamma frequencies, that they move differently during the behavior. Uh, and they move differently than the single unit that you are recording from the same electrode. So it means that uh, if you have the right tool uh, and the uh, right analysis to methods too, you, you can uh, obtain from, uh, from your site more information that uh, uh, are useful to the coding as uh, uh, more than what is usually uh, performed. And this, uh, I think it's important for, uh, uh, to change the idea of very basic uh, uh, argument that we have, uh, or idea that we have uh, on, uh, even on pathologies. This is a, a study on, um, uh, it's not from my lab, uh, uh, it was published uh, uh, three years ago in Junior Neuroscience, but it's uh, for a rare case where, where it's possible to have an electrode in a patient. And uh, you probably uh, know that uh, there are cases of uh, uh, epilepsy that are uh, drug resistant. And this epileptic patients uh, is necessary as a only solution since they are drug resistant to remove the, fo the focus of the epilepsy. So the piece of, of the brain where the, the activity usually starts. And uh, uh, what is done usually on this patient is that there are electrodes invasively placed in their brain and their brain is studied for a week or, so, or something like this. Uh, in, uh, uh, since a few years, uh, in this electrode, are, uh, different groups are placing microwires, so are replicating exactly from the methodology point of view what is normally obtained in uh, rodents and primates, non-human primates. So wh what you see here are different neurons recorded on the uh, area of the hippocampus uh, uh, aligned to the moment when the seizure starts. You see that the different neurons on the opposite of what was uh, believed, they don't start as a, a single population, but they have different contribution to the, to the uh, uh, epileptic seizure. That meaning that the, probably the, the level of population, or population representation of this uh, pathological uh, manifestation of the cortex is complicated because there are different actors that we need to, to understand more. And uh, uh, this is the last uh, uh, data um, slide that I'm going to show you. And it's uh, once again from my lab. It's very recent activity on using the Utah ray. That is the this uh, uh, electrode. That is a standard. It's not a, a recent uh, development technology. 
uh, 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 placed in the inserted surgically in the dorsal premotor cortex of a monkey. And in the le top left, there is, there, are, there is just the activity uh, as a spike, actually it's a multi-unit, it's, it's just all the spiking activity together, expressed as a standard deviation. So if you see red means that uh, this electrode was in the day of recording more variable than the uh, blue one. You see that there is a, a clear picture of uh, in a very few millimeters because the overall size of this uh, uh, probe is about 16 millimeters square area. Uh, and, but the interesting point to me on the right is that uh, this electrode stay wor works properly from many months. Uh, this was implanted uh, in September. This is a recording from December, months uh, later. And then in June, you see that it's possible with this kind of electrodes to study also plasticity because uh, I, I, as a very short message, the, the, what you see here is that the blue and red means uh, uh, correspond to different uh, activity of one of these electrodes for the left or right position of the, of the target to, for, for the monkey to receive the reward. And uh, while some of the electrodes after months are very stable, or, or at least uh, if not temporarily, they maintain the selection for the target, other are starting to be selected only later during the, the recording. So this, uh, what, what I mean is that there are technology that allow you to, to explore aspect of the brain function that was not possible to be done until uh, 10 years ago. Okay, so the brain lip consortium. I will be very fast on this. It's formed by the coordinator, that's Michele, and the other group other than me, that is uh, Mika Spira, sorry, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, Luc Gentet, that are now uh, from Amsterdam that moved to Lyon, and uh, uh, Klaus and Martini, Klaus uh, Burkena, the Martin Stelz uh, from NMI in Germany. What's the idea? The idea is that... Uh, <laughs> no, 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 there is no IET contribution. So the, the, the idea was to put together people with different competences, so Michele has competences uh, partially overlapping with Big Aspira 1 on uh, electrophysiology in uh, brain slides and, and dissociative cell cultures. Luca is one of the few lab in the, in the world that is able to record from patch clamp, the, the methodology that I described to you before in behaving animal. So from single unit, from single electrodes, uh, uh, sorry, from single uh, neurons is able to, to record at the same time uh, uh, calcium imaging, electrical activity on spiking, uh, using two photons, the calcium imaging, and uh, uh, membrane potential by, by, by patch clamping these neurons. And uh, uh, myself, uh, I described to you partially my activity. Uh, and uh, this group that is mainly a technological uh, uh, part. Uh, what was the idea uh, where uh, we, uh, what we explored, uh, we proposed to FET uh, was financed. There was an observation by Mika Spira in Jerusalem uh, years ago that it was possible to modify electrodes physically, to build mushroom on them, a mushroom very small on the size of one microns. And these mushrooms are uh, engulfed by neurons. Okay, this seems to be a property of neurons. So it was first test, tested with microspheres, but now we know that uh, if there is a, a, a sufficiently small uh, uh, new uh, 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 probe, whatever is the, there are different uh, uh, substrates in the, in the brain, uh, the, then the neurons doesn't move away, but then try to at, are attracted by the by this uh, by this small. Uh, protrusion. And uh, the nice thing that he observed that uh, without damaging the membrane of these neurons, uh, Micha was able to record uh, this uh, membrane potential, so the sub-threshold activity of, a neural act of, the, of, the, of the neurons. Uh, the problem is that uh, this was uh, shown with a very huge neurons, aplysia neurons, so it was an invertebrate. So the goal of uh, brain lip was to move from the aplysia to uh, more evolved animals, uh, vertebrates, so rodents uh, and uh, pr non-human primates. So this was uh, my job and uh, Lukjent uh, was in charge, uh, it's in charge of this part. 
and then uh, also to uh, microfabricate uh, uh, this electrode in order to, to minimize them and uh, making them compatible with the MIA, uh, uh, MIA uh, uh, technology that is currently used in many, uh, in many uh, uh, labs in the world. So these are essentially the objectives uh, that are uh, just uh, repeating what I, I just show you by, by, by figures. And uh, uh, so the, our goal is to, 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 to show that it's possible to use these electrodes uh, in, uh, in uh, vertebrates, that uh, these are effective and that for a long time uh, are able to record uh, uh, local field, uh, single spiking, uh, multi-unit, and also membrane potential activity. This is one of the first uh, steps that has been obtained. We are uh, all uh, at the second year of the project. This is one of the mushroom built in, in one of the MIA electrodes. And uh, there are uh, uh, initial probes that are available from, uh, from uh, insertion in the, uh, in the brain of uh, living animals, such as our mice and, uh, and uh, the monkeys. Uh, s this we are moving to uh, improve the, the the addition of the neurons to these uh, electrodes by uh, having a p dot and uh, s uh, carbon nanotubes uh, uh, over the surface of these uh, mushrooms and uh, so the, the but the, at the moment uh, because i think it's important also to to describe what are the problems we are still waiting for the technology development. So it's a very ambitious uh, uh, project, uh, but uh, we need to have uh, uh, electrodes working. Uh, I would like to, uh, mm, to conclude with this uh, uh, slide because I think it's important to understand what could be the advantage of uh, using such kind of electrodes in the near future, if they are, will be available in a behaving animal. Uh, by comparing this, uh, uh, the, the probably known to everyone, uh, optogenetic uh, power, that is the possibility to uh, uh, mo modify the activity at the level of the single neuron uh, by suppressing or denouncing their activity uh, by using genetic, uh, genetic uh, probes. Uh, or th there, are, uh, at there is a, at least one problem with this approach. The one is that will be probably never available for humans. Uh, it's difficult to imagine that one day we will be able to inject the virus uh, uh, with uh, uh, genetic probes uh, in, in, the, in the brain of a human. And uh, anyway, they at up to today, they are not really working with the uh, non-human primates. So we are limited with the, with the use in uh, some aspects of the behavior like cognition that uh, c could be better explored in uh, uh, so, so some, some uh, species of animal. And the, the other side of this electrode that uh, is engulfed by the electrode, that, by, the, by, the, uh, by the neuron, that, and then uh, I described that you is uh, allow to allowing to record selectivity from a single neuron, is also that it, uh, it permits to stimulate selectivity to one single electrode. Uh, so the, the if the, the, the will, we will be able to uh, to succeed uh, with the with the project, we will have a, uh, in a, uh, a the possibility to stimulate all the neurons that uh, will be engulfing our electrodes selectively in a way that is very similar to the optogenetic approach. At least it will be tested uh, how, how how much will be uh, possible this. Uh, so. This is, uh, I think that uh, now you realize why I, I stated at the beginning, I don't know if I'm on the right person <laughs> on the right place. So uh, uh, our project is really uh, on, uh, on neurotechnology. There's no biomimetics. There's some basic, basic science on, on the idea that technology could be of help. Uh, of course, I, I do have some idea that maybe I will share with you during discussion, but uh, probably not related to brain leap. Thank you. If you have a, any <laughs> question. Thank you. Thank you. Question. You, Stefan, you emphasize very much, let's say, weaving out the membrane potential. Mm -hmm. yeah? But I could say, well, as far as the functional properties of the nervous system is concerned, it's all about spikes. And 
the measure of potential might reflect something about the input to that noise, sort of filtered by properties of the general, that is well understand the information processing in the network, you just can, can stick to the, the lab mission stuff. Right? So wh why, why is this to be dissatisfied with that? Uh, I think it's a signal. It, it's, it's integrated. So it's, an, it's a signal that does remain the same as arrived to the arrived to the to the tissue where it's uh, uh, coded. So uh, at, at the the level of integration, I think is one of the way to study how the brain works. So it, it's true that the spike is the only output of neurons, but the how the spike is emitted depends of the of the way how the local field are integrated at the level of the right. membrane. And uh, most of this membrane activity never uh, appear at the level of a, of a spike, of spike activity. And some neurons are never contributing to spiking activity. Yeah. So uh, if, if we would like to emulate the, the brain, uh, maybe it's also important to uh, understand what is other than spike available in, right. the, in the brain. Well, in terms of network, I mean, right. of the circuits. state of the network mm -hmm. while the spikes are like probing those states. Mm -hmm. So the, the subset of dynamics tells you in some sense this might be the core of information processing. Mm -hmm. It's being probed by forcing the, the neurons to go to the feedback threshold and see what it does. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I see what you... Uh, so it means there might be a dissociation yeah. between the sub-threshold member uh, let, let me try to argument well, differently. Yeah, yeah right. let me try just to finish the argument ri differently. Just my, my, my answer with uh, one more point to the, uh, it's very quick. The, uh, most of the studies in uh, um, human neuroscience are based on EEG because it's not invasive. And you know that inv uh, EEG is essentially measuring uh, local field. That is part of the membrane activity, but we don't know how much is part and what is the relationship between the two. So I, I just wanted to address your comment that you don't feel, you know, should necessarily be here. So uh, neurotechnology is, is in the title of, of yeah. the current convergent science network action. Uh, the previous one was biomimetic and biohybrid. Uh, so f for me, neurotechnology comes under the uh, category of biohybrid systems. Uh, the biohybrids are anywhere where you have an artificial system, artificial system interfaced with uh, a biological system in some interesting way, and neurotechnology, of course, is exactly that. The relationship with biomimetics is that in order to build an effective uh, biohybrid, or in your case, a neurotechnology, you have to understand the biological system, and y you have to reverse engineer the biological system in order to be able to interface to it. So uh, your field requires, of course, biology, and it requires biomimetics in order to operate. So it's, it's natural that these things should become under the same banner. Um, I think our, uh, my view, I think Paul shares it, is that in the future, this distinction between you know, artificial devices and, and biological systems is going to become more and more blurred. We're already enhancing ourselves with all kinds of different devices. You know, phones are an example of things we can't really leave behind anymore. Uh, those things will be in, in the future implanted. So uh, I think the, the living machines uh, vision very much incorporates biohybrid systems and therefore neurotechnology is, is one of the really cutting edge areas of biohybrids. Uh, I fully agree, of course. Okay. Wait, where is Jose? Jose, you want to? I am. Are you up? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Stefano. And I do believe that the scientific question of linking nanostrains to information processing is at the heart of our future literature term. <laughs> Good for us. Uh, microphone? Ah, oh yeah, still. It's always this way.
Huh? Number two cup is actually yeah. <laughs> number two cup. It's it's good to go. Yeah. Is it on? Do you hear me? Yeah. No, it's not on. Ah, yeah. Now it's on. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, that's not what I, that's not what you want to see, probably. You want to say you're also the wrong person for this discussion. You want to talk about the solar system. <laughs> yeah. Milky Way. Um, Nadine, yep. It's Macintosh, right? Doesn't work. Uh, what is it? PowerPoint. Okay, so who I am, so it's me. And uh, the first thing to notice is that I am uh, affiliated in a, a energy research institute. Um, for the you guys that are in uh, neuroscience or cognitive science, it sounds uh, interesting already. So the second thing, uh, I'm going to talk about a subset of what I do, and then I will make the link of a research and energy institute. So basically what I do is that, it's written there. Uh, I'm studying animal behavior, uh, social animal behavior, and we are designing uh, what we call biohybrid systems, which is a collection of animals trying to uh, collaborate with uh, robots. Uh, I've done that uh, for cockroaches, you will see a bit of, of that. I've done that with chicken, and now I'm doing that um, with fish uh, in, a, in a European project I'm going to talk about. But the basic idea is to do um, um, social behavior uh, combined with a robotic approach and a mathematical um, framework, developing framework. Well, so what's, what's the idea behind that? I was doing that before, but then comes those guys uh, that discover uh, something that they call atomics. Uh, they, they realize that if you use uh, a machine vision techniques to extract data out of uh, videos because usually when you study animal behavior it's done by uh, video recording if you use some technology or by paper and pencil recording in, in the old time. So suddenly they discover that uh, you can analyze the, the videos in a more systematic way and to have a more quantified approach of uh, studying behavior. And if you can do that, if you do that on animal models like uh, Drosophila, you may have uh, the possibility to do screens and then to make the link with the genetic or the neuroscience below. The problems of uh, studying mutants when you try to study high level uh, behavior, as you know, is to have screens that are rapid. Uh, the kind of experiments we do in animals, in social animal behavior, to come up with one model, it takes three to four years. So it's too slow. That's my old studies. For instance, if we uh, try to model uh, collective decision making choices in group of cockroaches, uh, and we want to have a mathematical model that is there, I'm not going to go into the details, it's a dynamical system approach, and then the decision corresponds to the steady states of the system what the population does corresponds to the status of the system, and they have to choose to uh, gather between different places and uh, all together or spread among the possibilities we offer to them. So those kind of experiments last for four years, so it's too slow. Uh, um, it, it needs to be automated if you want to one day make a link to the what's going on inside the animal. So the, the other th things we were starting to do is um, this stuff is if we understand the collective behavior of the cockroaches in this, in this case, if we have a mathematical model about that, uh, we can design a robot, and if we program the robot to correspond to the model we are doing, uh, this, that's the robot, okay? It's a kind of matchbox, uh, electronic matchbox on wheels. If, we, if, if that robot is mimicking the model I showed you before, then you may expect that it's going to, and if there is a link between the cockroaches and the, the robots, you may expect that there is a collective decision-making process that is going to be shared by the robots and the animals. Um, that's the proof of the concept of that paper. The second thing is that if the robots are accepted and behaving animal-like, uh, we still can program the robot and change one of the parameters or several parameters and of course, uh, we know from nonlinear dynamical system, if you make a little change in the system, it brings b a, 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 gl a global change on the whole system. And that's the, the second point. Uh, modulating a few parameters on the robot, not changing its global behavior model, just 
uh, modulating some of the parameter makes the whole system switch from one state to another, which means we have a, a form of control uh, on, on what, of what the population is doing. So the idea of that paper was to prove the concept that uh, if we understand animal behavior, we can mimic it by uh, robots, if, uh, hopefully. And if we mix the two together, uh, we have some biohybrid system. And with biohybrid system, we can start to do something new. So why do we do that? We do that because we want to understand animal behavior. And if we understand how it works, we replicate it in a robot. The robot is also some form of model embodied model of the mathematical model describing the animal. And then it asks, it, it, it's also a challenge for robotics because uh, how to design a robot to interact with animal, it's quite difficult in fact. Animals usually don't care at all about robots. They, they don't belong to their uh, ecosystem, so there is no reason for them to, to go and interact with those machines, contrary to human beings that are willing to interact with machines. Right? If you, you can sell Tamagotchis to people, it's a completely stupid device, but millions of people are willing to interact with it. You can try to sell a robot to cockroaches, the first reaction is they run away of that because it's perceived as a threat in their environment. And so there you need to, to establish a link. The link here is, is established by a high-tech device, which is that, it's a paper filter with the olfact olfactory cues uh, sending to the cockroaches, I'm a cockroach. So a biohybrid system, uh, to put it simple, is a social biohybrid system is embedding in the animal environment uh, some robots. So you have different kind of robots that you can have. That's uh, obviously what you call a robot. It's an autonomous device, mobile, that is uh, uh, part of the group, like the cockroach experiment I show you, and that the kind of things we are trying to do now with fish, and my other colleagues are doing that with bees. They don't have bl flying bees, of course, for the moment. It doesn't exist yet. And so, but we don't limit ourselves to mobile robots. We want also to build intelligent systems, environmental systems. So the robot is, the en is within the environment. That's what they are doing now in the project I'm going to talk about with the bees. The robots are static devices in the environment, but they are still uh, um, are sensing and actuating what's going on in the environment. It's an intelligent environment. So they can send signal, perceive if there are bees, and then send signals, and you can still program to, to, to influence the pattern of what the bees are doing. Uh, you can have that and other things. And then you have the last uh, type, the cyborg. Either you plug the robot or part of the robot on the animal. We don't do that. Uh, I'm not going to do that. So plugging uh, robots into the animal system but still they can carry something. So not plugging it directly. By, by plugging, I mean plugging the robot in the nerve, on the nervous system of the, on, 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 of the, the animal. Uh, but they can carry some devices. You can uh, embed a small robot, and there are people who have been trying that with, uh, uh, for instance, cows or sheep. You, you, you give them a, a collar that carries some device that can be called a robot also because it's sensing and actuating. So, so that's very briefly what I'm doing. So now the, 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 the European project I'm uh, representing is coordinated by Thomas Schmickel in Gatz. They are a bee lab, so they are studying bee collective behavior. They have the same kind of approach that I have presented to you. So they are also doing robotics and they're trying to embed the models they get from the bees into robots and now in the project they're also building a system to interact with bees and to have these collective, share collective behaviors between robots and, and, uh, and bees. And I'm with uh, the EPFL, Francesco Mondada. Uh, he's designing the robots that I've been using for the cockroaches, for the chicken, and now for the fish. And what is the aim of the project? Very briefly and vaguely. So that's the way we, we sold it to the <laughs> to the EU and the referees. So uh, the question is, can we build uh, a robotic system, an ICT system, in the, in the, because it was a specific call for ICT. Uh, um, can we build an ICT system that learns uh, itself to communicate with the animals? So the, as I said, I will show, I will just briefly uh, conclude uh, after that. 
The problem is that it takes years to build robots, and it takes years to get models, and it takes years, and at the end of the day, it costs a lot, and it takes years, so it's, very, it's a very slow process, so there is an urgent need to automate that. And atomics is the same stuff. If you want to bring back the ethology to the level of assays to make the link with genetics and neuroscience, it's too slow, it's far too slow, it's, it takes years, so you never have interesting, when I listen to, well, you are all in neuroscience, when I listen to people in neuroscience talking about behavior, I laugh, of course, because it's simplistic behavior. Here I'm talking about free moving animals uh, doing social behavior in a specific environment. It's still lab experiments, of course, but it's far from just perception and action. It's more a, a bit elaborate. But then you have a gap because you cannot, I cannot plug electrodes in those animals. There are many. Uh, I cannot, f uh, well, I, you, you understand the point. You, if you make mutants, we can test them, but the problem is it takes three years to test a mutant. I mean, it's a joke. Uh, you have tens of mutants to test. Uh, so um, the, f the main thing is automating the whole system. The design of the robot the, and the experiment and the, the, the modeling approach. Just to give you a picture of what I'm doing. So the robots are not really in the water. With, that's a real tank with zebrafish. We are studying zebrafish for the moment because it's a model, uh, an animal model, you know it. Uh, I don't have to say it. So the robots are outside the tank. That's the tank. That's the, the bottom of the tank. And then we are moving lures. Uh, in the tank. So these are not the final lures that are, we are moving. That's just lures to lure you <laughs> in what we are doing. Uh, so uh, they don't look like that necessarily. So the, what the robots are going to do is they're going to move stuff in the environment of the animal and trying to make the fish uh, to be interested or at least to react to what those things are doing and not reacting in a in a, in, a, in a trivial way, like running away because they are scared uh, and stuff like that. And so the question is, uh, what, do, what cues do we have to send to the zebrafish to make them think that this stuff is interesting to interact socially with it? And the, as the answer is not ver very easy. In fact, they don't care at all about what you put in there. And if the answer is uh, put the fish, it's not interesting as an answer because if you need to be a fish to interact with the fish, it's not an interesting answer. So uh, what I'm asking is, uh, uh, come on guys, atomics, is it serious? I mean, can we do that? Uh, and so the project is about that. So what I'm working on for the moment is trying to automate the whole process by machine learning and evolutionary computing uh, analysis of the data. So basically you get the position of, of everybody. I mean, basically it's not an easy thing to do, but basically you get the position of everything in the system, and then you have a lot of uh, data. You, you get a video of 15 frames or 25 frames per second of 10 individuals for an hour. That's about the things we get for the moment. And then you have all the trajectories, the position of those guys, and you have to extract some kind of information out of that. And it takes a lot of time to analyze that data. So the idea is can we get, uh, by machine learning and evolutionary computing, uh, the uh, specific data. I've done that with the chicken project that I haven't shown here, where we were automating the process of doing heterograms. And so uh, basically at the end of the day, at the end of the project, I was able to take the data out, out of the experiment. I mean, the experiment was for about half an hour. At the end of half an hour, there was a print on the, on the, on the printer with the ethogram of the chicken that was observed because everything was automated. But then, of course, the project ended up, and I didn't have the money to continue. So the second part of the, of the, of the thing is to uh, produce automatically um, mathematical models. In fact, you have a problem. If I go back uh, rapidly to the issue, I've shown you an equation that I call macroscopic. It's describing a group of animals in a very simplified uh, system because the equation, if some of you know equations, it was a zero dimension system. There was no space in the equations. It was ordinary differential equation. But we have a spatial problem. But then with that equation, you go to a roboticist and you say, OK, build a robot that does that. And if it does that, we, you get the same collective decision making of the cockroaches in the same kind of setup. But 
oh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with programming robots. That's not the way robots are programmed. You have to deal with all the details. The, the, and the devil is in the details. You, you, you don't need with macroscopic description of your behavior. You have to deal with every detail, wall avoiding, obstacle avoiding, uh, 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 interrupt, what priorities are in the task. So, it's, so what, do, so what do, did we do uh, at the end of the day? We were tinkering the programming of the robot by trial and errors until finally we got, maybe we were lucky, the same result at the mi microscopic level, what the, the program running in the robot, which was dealing with all the details, and the robots were replicating the macroscopic equation. Again, a process of three years of tinkering programming robots. Three years with a bunch of engineers and ourselves. I mean, it's a, it's a huge cost. Uh, so it, you, you cannot do that. So uh, what, what, what I'm working on, uh, I'm, I'm not showing you the result, you have to believe me anyway. <laughs> so what I'm doing now is I take the, the differential equation and the bifurcation diagram to which it corresponds. The bifurcation diagram is the decision-making process. We can discuss that over lunch if you want to understand what I mean by that. That equation, I describe it microscopically at the, at the level of the robot by the finer state machine. So the finer state machine is probability between states. So I'm keeping moving, then I have a probability to turn, then I have a probability to join pole that is not listening, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So you have a gap. The problem is you have a set of parameters for your finite state machine, and you don't know them. Any, you, don't, any, you don't know none of them, I mean. And you have this differential equation that is the target. So what, I've, we, what, what we have success, successfully done, it's trivial. I mean, it's trivial. Uh, you take an evolutionary computing algorithm and you say, that's the bifurcation diagram, that's the target, that's the parameters, match those guys together. And the next step we are going to do is, that's the finer state machine, write the program for the robot. I mean, write the program, not, we don't write the program anymore. So you take the differ differential equation, you, you guess the finer state machine, and the, the, the evolutionary computing does the matching, and the, the system writes the program into the robot. The next step is also linked to this one, but I don't want to write the finer state machine myself. I don't want to decide what are the states of my animals that are interesting. I want the system to discover the finer state machines. And that's what I did with the chicken experiment. So you have the trajectory of a chicken, it's in printing stuff, so you have the robot that, the, that uh, behaves like the, the mother, and the little chick is imprinted on the robot, so it's trying to follow. So what we do, we analyze the trajectory automatically, and at the end of the day, we get a finite state machine description of what the behavior of the chicken is. So the behavior is basically joining the robot, because it's far away, following the robot, stopping, because I want to stop, because I don't follow all the time, stuff like that. So you have all those states, and you can, in a fraction of a second on a, on a, on a classic computer, have the probability transition over all, all, all those states that you have identified automatically. That's, the, that's the, the, the final state machine model, and it's automatically generated. So I try to combine those two things in the stuff, okay? So I said I, wa I wanted to be short, <laughs> but I'm giving you a lot of information uh, uh, in, in very compact way. So what I want to do next uh, in the near future, that means that I'm writing proposal about that, it's to uh, build biohybrid system at the micron scale, so uh, 10 to the minus 6 meter, uh, at the cellular, so, so it's about 10 microns to 100 microns. And the biohybrid systems of uh, artificial shells uh, combine with uh, bacteria in a, to form a biohybrid system that hopefully will produce some collective behavior. So we are, uh, for the moment, developing the technology to do that at a um, microfluidic scale, and then uh, if we get the money, we will do that in a biohybrid way. So the other things I'm going to do is, because I have nothing else to do in my life, is to <laughs> extend the interaction to the five uh, biological kingdom. So yes, I want to robots to interact with bacteria, uh, with uh, fungi, with plants, and animals is done already, I mean done. <laughs> I, have one exa I have three examples, uh, and only one works really nicely. And then uh, the other thing I'm trying to do is to ask a very theoretical question, but at the same time 
it can be brought to experiments, is what's the place of the robots in an ecosystem? For the moment, the robots are designed to uh, uh, live with us, I mean, us human beings, as part of our uh, uh, technology. But there is something that we call uh, ecosystem, I mean, we are part of the ecosystem, you know that I'm talking about the ecosystem where we don't live all the time, the jungle. I'm joking, but uh, you see what I mean. And what's the place of robots in uh, an ecosystem where the human beings are not necessarily present all the time? If you ask me a question, I can uh, tell you all the science fiction stuff uh, I'm thinking about. So now I'm, uh, because I'm a good boy, I answer the question by Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, what, what, what are the strength of this community? So I think we have a very strong multidisciplinary community. I know it's uh, biased towards the cognitive science here in this workshop, but it's not the case if you go to the Living Machines, if, or if you've been to the Living Machines conference, it's br much broader than that. And it's very interesting, and those people are interacting, and nearly everybody's interesting part of what the other is doing. Well, we're not expert in everything, of course, but still, th we see there are common things there. I think it's one of the community that is really addressing the convergent science framework. The convergent science is a bit of buzzword. Oh, nanotechnology, computer science, genetics, uh, biology, everything is, is going to converge. Well, it's how? But in this community, I've seen people really discussing about that. But it's also covering a, a, a huge array of systems and levels. You, so you have guys at the uh, tiny scales, even now uh, micron scales, then you have the guys with humanoid robots, then you have all kind of robots, then you have all kind of science, from cognitive science to this, the simple stuff I do with a dynamical system description of social behavior. So it's huge, I mean, the, the diver it, and it's a bit, it's a strength, but it's also a weakness. We'll come to that later, because it's so diverse that what's the common point? And then there is this concept of living machines. I didn't invent it, so uh, it's probably you guys that came up with the Living Machine conference stuff. And the Living Machine is something uh, interesting and I will come back later to that. So the weakness is, um, di the diversity is a, is a weakness also. It's a strength, but it's a, but it's a problem because how do we maintain shared objective? And what's the weight of cognitive science? I'm just, uh, it's because I want to argue with Paul. There's too much cognitive science, I mean, guys. We don't care about cognitive science. We don't have machines to deal with cognitive science. It's plain of bullshit. I'm just joking, but I mean, the <laughs> the, but the problem is uh, it's not specific to cognitive science. It's just because that, that's in the title of uh, the, the workshop going on. But you have the same question of any other community. What's the place of the people doing biohybrid system at the micron scale here. Is it, do we, do we need to interact with people doing cognitive science? I, I think th my answer is yes. But maybe the, on the other way around, maybe you're not. And then so you have the problem of what the com your community, how do you interact with the others? Those aliens guys doing the stuff at, that I do. And maybe nobody understands what I'm doing. Uh, and so uh, we have also um, not really center activities in every area, I mean. They are, because it depends on people, so uh, not all the topics are covered in an equivalent way. And then we have still this gap between research and industry, that's what Paul was mentioning. I mean, guys, uh, what's, the, what, what, what's the purpose of all that stuff you're doing? It, the, there is no application. And, we, and uh, well, I'm not going to repeat, because Paul has been talking about that, uh, very, uh, in a very good way, so, but there is an issue. And then there is this question, but do we really take seriously the concept of living machines? I mean, do we? That, so uh, we have to come back to that. And so, Yeah, I, I put it, uh, you see, I've put it in a strength mm -hmm. and in a weakness. Because when you have the, the whole, the, whole the, the, the scheme that you've presented, it's so broad. And we, we are going to have, um, I ha I'm discussing with uh, a chemist. 
Then they say, what are you doing? I'm doing robots. What are you doing? I'm trying to synthesize, you, you guess it. So they are so far away from what we are doing that they don't think we w they should discuss with us. And I'm trying to convince, no, you should, you should. And I'm going to give some answer to why they should discuss with us. And so um, the opportunities, you know them. I mean, that's my uh, take of it. Okay? Uh, that's what we want to do, no? Uh, the second point, uh, that's the same as the f first one, but uh, say in another way. And then there is this political stuff that Paul knows better than me. And then we have to still keep alive living machine. <laughs> so now more seriously, um, no, th this was serious also, but you know it. I mean, it's obvious. I don't have to s just put it there just... Uh, uh, if you have any comment on that. So do we really take seriously the living machine concept? I mean, so living systems are based on specific materials. The chemistry of living system is well known. The number of uh, uh, elements used in living system and the proportion of them is well known. Okay, it's basically a carbon chemistry and it's wet. So living system well, it's obvious what I say here. I told you I just came here to say obvious things. Huh? Otherwise, well, that's why we asked you for saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, living systems are evo devo, you know. They are reproducing. There is reproduction and growth, you know it. Living systems are sustainable. I mean, they are here for three billion years, or even more probably, and and they will be thriving if we disappear anyway. And. But the problem is none, none of our technology correspond to any of those stuff. The chemistry is different. There is no evo devo. There is no life cycle based on reproduction and growth. At reproduction, you may argue about it because we, we make the reproduction ourselves or the factories are doing and we can automate reproduction, blah, blah, blah. But there is no growth in the system. They are not at all sustainable. And that's my last point. So if we want so why, why the problem is because our technology doesn't correspond to any of that, in fact, they are not sustainable. So uh, because they are built on completely different materials, they are not sustainable. Because the energy cost of running our technology is huge, it's not sustainable. Because it's mainly based, and it's for the same thing as the first one, on non-renewable non -renewable resources, it's not sustainable. And some of those resources are going to disappear within the next 50 years. Next 50 years at the technology level, it's tomorrow. At the human scale, it's yesterday, <laughs> history. And so we are facing a wall, and the wall has been described a while ago. I'm not talking about Malthus, right? I'm talking about technology. This is, I don't know if you have heard about the Hubber Hubbard curve. Hubbard was a geologist working for Shell, the old company. Uh, so Shell is selling oil and they were wanted to know until when they're going to exist. In 1956, he came with this hypothesis, oil is going to disappear in the, 21st, in the 21st century. And that's true. You may argue about when is the peak, but oil is going to disappear within the 21st century. If you look at the production of oil that's an old graphic. In fact, we are peaking in the oil production. Then you may argue, OK, we are going to extend that by a few years because we are going to get uh, any drop of oil in, in shales, in uh, bad condition, whatever, new mining stuff. And you can still drag a little there. But you see the scale. The scale is 2050 means tomorrow. And it's before that probably we will reach the peak of oil and we will be declining before 2050. And then you say, so what? So what? Who cares? But the whole chemistry we have is based on oil. The whole chemistry. I mean, robots are based on oil because all the plastic stuff you put on a robot, it's based on oil. The second thing is that at the European level, all the food we eat is produced by oil. I mean, thanks to oil. So we are eating oil. We are transforming oil into the food we are eating. The day we don't have enough oil, we stop eating. The whole system, the whole European system of agriculture drops. And we are starving. We start to starve. So it's a huge problem, in fact. 
And it's basically, it's a, for the moment, it's a business as usual. And the technology you, we are developing is business as usual also. And then, uh, th like the title says, okay, the peak of oil was the first one because it's the most obvious one. And then the second one is that, but what, what about the other, the, other, the other resources? And then you look at the other resources, and you know that, maybe, probably. You look at the elements, and the, the one, this is, uh, this is I, I only stay, I only uh, repeating obvious things. This is Wikipedia figures, right? It's, it doesn't cost you a lot to, to find them. So the red ones are the metals that are used, uh, uh, important in the technology. And then you have the rarest, the rarest uh, metals that we use in our technology. And then you have these rare earth oxides. Basically, when you hear rare earth, it means electronics. If you don't have rare earth, you don't have electronics as we know it. And then, in fact, we, we have delegated the production of rare earth to China. Well, I'm not going to go into geopolitics if it's a good idea that uh, China is uh, deciding if uh, the whole world is having electronics or not. Tell that to Japanese. Uh, and look at the tension between Japan, that is an electronic-based uh, industry, uh, with China that is uh, setting quota e for exports. And so the USA and even in France, I don't know if you have heard uh, one of the former ministers, he said it's time to put back on the mining industry because it's a, tr it's a strategic, strategic issue. So what we have seen for the oil, that's the first peak we're going to reach, it's true for everything, except maybe the one silicium, because it's so uh, present. Maybe iron, it's also very present, so we don't have problems. But electronics is going to disappear within this century. And then you have doomsday predictions that are old also. In the 70s, you, you've heard maybe the the first book published in 1972, The Limits of Grow The Limits to Growth. And that's the update 30 years later, and they're still repeating the same thing. We, we, we are going to go there. And I take um, one of the, the, the pessimistic scenario they show. Basically, all scenarios show a problem, but this one is pessimis pessimistic because we are still living there. Most of us will be still living here. But you, say what the you see what the prediction is going to be. It's that, in fact, the population, the resources are going to disappear. The industrial output is going to fall down and the population is going to start to die and the production of food also. So you may argue about uh, the, s the time scale, when this is, when if this thing is going to happen. You may argue about the equations. And I do that in other uh, topics and stuff like that. Nevertheless, the oil peak is going to happen in the next 20, 30 years, or even before, according to some. But I don't think it's going to be before because it goes when going to extract everything extractable from anywhere. Um, and I'm not talking about climate change, right? Jo I, I leave that for the, <laughs> for the fun of you. Uh, yeah. So. All technologies based on electronic are going to disappear. So I go to future and emerging um, conferences, uh, European conferences. The last one was two years or three years ago, I don't remember. So you have the bunch of all the engineers doing future and emerging technology in the room. F 400, 200 people, I don't know. And then those guys are talking the internet everywhere, the internet of objects. The, uh, the, you have the Apple. New iPhones, new watches, devices programmable everywhere, electronics, electronics, electronics. And they, they are doing business as we have electronics forever. Uh, electronics is going to disappear this century. So the internet is going to disappear because you know the cost, the energy cost of a, a cloud service. I mean, you know how much energy those, you need a power plant just to power those computers that are running Amazon, Google, and so on. It, the energy cost is huge, but when we reach peak oil, we have less energy. Then you have to decide in Europe, do you eat or do you have an iPhone? That's the choice you, we are going to reach within this century. So the, the robots are going to be gone this, at the end of the century. They are going to be gone because you will not have the electronics or the energy or the resources. So what are we doing? What the future and, and, and technology 
people in Europe are doing. They are doing business as usual. More electronics, more internet, robots everywhere. But of course it's going to happen. I'm not saying that it's not going to happen. It's going to happen. We will have everything connected. Your fridge, your uh, teacup, everything is going to be connected. Electronics will be anywhere, everywhere, and then bam, the peak will be there and the whole system will collapse. So I think if we take into account seriously the living machines hypothesis, we go back to this question. Living systems are sustainable because they are, based, they are based on specific chemistry with specific mechanism for being sustainable. And if we take seriously the living machine hypothesis, if we want to design technology as living systems, we should hugely invest in doing that. Uh, that's one of my main selling points for, the, for the, the approach. So the problem is, you, I have a discussion in, a, in the energy department, so I go to meet physicists and engineers about energy discussion. And then you come up with a, a process of producing fuel with um, cyanobacteria, so biofuels, okay, that you put in tanks with uh, light and then photosynthesis, you get fuel out of it. And then all those guys that are used to heavy power plants, nuclear, uh, France is about nuclear plants, right? Uh, heavy power plants, they say, what's the yield of that stuff? And the answer is, we don't know exactly what's the yield. It's difficult to compute, but anyway, it's low. What you coming, what you talking about? You know what the yield of a power or nuclear power plant is? And I say, yeah, but uh, is it renewable? So that's the, the one of the things. If you discuss about yield, now the, it's the same in agriculture. They say um, any ecological approach to agriculture, you have a discussion, what's the yield? What's the yield? The current yield of the European agriculture is one of the highest in the world. We've been multiplying by three, up to five times the yields of the beginning of the 20th century by uh, basically uh, the entrants that are chemical based on phosphate, non-renewable, -re and other organic I mean, from organic chemistry, uh, pesticide and stuff, non-renewable if you don't have oil anymore, or, or a big issue. And then you multiply the yields by five. And then if you come up with an ecological approach of agriculture, they say, but your yields are ridiculous. And my answer to yield are ridiculous is, if you're not renewable, within the century, your yield is going to be zero. Uh, so if we take into account the living system approach, and if you really want to develop uh, a sustainable technology, the only way is to change everything we do, the materials we do, the way we design the robots and stuff like that. So of course it's not going to be happen to tomorrow. I mean, we will have electronics for the next 50 years and so, and the robotic revolution is going to happen and all that stuff. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. But I'm saying if we want to forecast what's going to happen at the end of the century, we better start now because 50 years is a very short time scale to reinvent the chemistry of the materials we are using uh, in our technology. So that's a basic message and then we're going to eat. <laughs> and so the last, um, so that you know, I mean, I don't have to say that. And other fields, just to conclude that. So um, you, you have those guys that are doing interesting stuff. You have artificial cells, and it's linked to also an industry that is producing um, uh, synthetic, it's connected to synthetic biology. You may, you may call it synthetic biology or genetic engineering, I don't care, it's just buzzwords. Uh, it's, uh, it's transforming the living system to, to into factories. I mean, uh, we we in the lab we have people transforming cyanobacteria to produce some kind of chemicals that is directly in, uh, usable in the chemical industry. Or there are people transforming fungi to digest wood because in fact bacteria don't digest wood. And if you want to have ethanol or other chemistry, you better break down the, the, the wood before. Then you have also embodied evolutionary computing for morphologies because we have to redesign completely the morphologies of what we have. And then we have the, ba the most urgent question is material sciences. We don't have the materials to do. Yeah. 
we don't have the materials to do to be sustainable. So that I've said that. And then in the in the in our it's back to uh, Tony. It's back to you about the ethical issues. We have none in the in our community. There are none. <laughs> where where are they? Um, That's it. Have you finished? Yeah. Uh, I think we should uh, have lunch because everyone's yeah. very hungry and have the discussion after lunch. Thanks to all the speakers.